podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Hello. Right. Um, so, I thought I would actually start going a step back because some people asked some questions and I didn't give a very clear answer. Ah. I don't, so you compute this, sorry, I wanted to say. Uh, you, compute the, the, you compute the central charge of the Virasor algebra and it's D, because you have, and one way. Oh, so you have a, yes, as I realized, the Virasor algebra is an algebra for any value of that D. It's called the central charge. And people do conformal field theories with virtually any value of C you can name, well, C greater than one, perhaps. Uh, but for the free boson, which is what we're considering, it's C equals one. It's you, you compute it from the field theory. So it's not if you if you give me a, 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 C, a C of T, the central charge is determined. It's not a free parameter. And that's what we've done here. We basically we have uh, D copies of what a free boson because there's just D scalar fields. So that's why it's and each w scalar field is contributing one to the central charge. And we've computed that. But there are other ther theories, like the minimal models, or you name it, for which C is different from 1. But it's a OK. Now, now, the quick thing I wanted to clear up was this discussion about the null, st uh, the, the null states and the gauge symmetry and the scattering amplitudes. So physically, you would want to calculate expectation value of some operator between two physical states. Now, the first thing you realize is an operator like this can be expanded in terms of its positive creation modes, its negative creation modes, and its zero modes. But uh, these guys annihilate on the right, and these guys annihilate on the left. So the only guy that contributes is this. So you're always looking at this kind of object. And now you want to say, well, what happens if I shift by a null state? This would shift by some null state. So it would go to well, itself plus a null state. Now my claim is that Zero modes actually on null states always give you back a null state. Perhaps a different one, but that's always a null state, and hence this is, this is going to be zero. So that's how it works. Now to check this, you just want to check that LP on your null state, your new null state, well, that's the commutator, because LP on the null state is zero. But this, whatever it's going to be, is going to be a sum of positive moded oscillators, so it's going to annihilate. So this is just some sum of positive moded stuff, but this will give you zero. And you can check a similar calculation for L0 minus 1. So the real fact is that, in some sense, these null states get shifted around by uh, the zero modes. OK. So I did indeed give a too brief an explanation. Well, so next is the closed string. Yeah? So mathematically, the closed string really is just two copies of the open string, which is why we did the open string first. Um, right. So of course, it's a closed string, although it is just convention, nobody complains that you 
make sigma periodic with period two pi. And for us, you know, of course you want, it's been mentioned before, these things to be single valued. However, if, if you happen to have uh, circles in your space time, then you need not have this. If x mu itself is a periodic variable, then you don't have to have this. And this leads to what's called winding numbers because the string will, the uh, spatial direction of the string can wrap around the spatial direction in space time. I have to do that an integer number of times. So in principle, you could add this, two pi r times some winding number, the winding number of an integer. This is important for toroidal compactifications and t-duality, but we're not going to think about it today. Um, but it is crucial in general. So if anyone says what winding numbers are, it's that. It's where the string literally winds around some fixed number of times around a, a compact direction. Okay, well here of course the mode expansion is basically what we've always been writing. There's no identification of left and right movers. So it's all very similar, but unfortunately, there's a lot more writing. So, um, what are the physical state conditions? It's the same as before, but there's left and right moving versions of everything. So you have LP on a physical state is LP tilde on a physical state to zero. L zero minus one physical state is L zero tilde minus one in the physical state. Okay, well again, we want to look at L0, which is in some sense preferred. So for us, L0. Ah, yeah. Can we just call it one? Yeah. I haven't yet, okay. All right, I see people. Of A, the meaning of A is one. No, actually, it's actually A is the the eigenvalue of A naught. No. Yes, you can say that. The physical meaning. So, so it's indeed it's important. A isn't always equal to one. If you do d brains, it can change. And in fact, later on when we do superstrings, it'll change. So it's actually not always equal to one. It's a function. It's it's, 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 it's piecewise continuous on various theory sets. Um, it is, in effect, it's the zero point energy. This is like the energy functional, and this is the zero point energy, intuitively. Of course, an A is called the intercept in old papers. You know, it really dates back a long time. Okay, let's keep it in, it's a good idea. So L zero is alpha prime P squared over four. This four, well, remember the four was gone in the open string case. Um, because of some normalization issue. But, okay, plus this number operator. And L0 tilde, well, it's also P squared over four, plus the other number operator, where N is this sum A minus P, A P, mu mu, C P mu mu, the analog sum of a positive uh, states, the analog of the number operator in harmonic oscillator, and here A tilde A tilde. Now, so these last two equations are very similar. What you usually, and what you see is a uh, that obviously the difference implies that n equals n tilde acting on a state, yeah? So basically, I can just consider 
the following. I rewrite the last two lines as, if you like, L0 plus L0 tilde minus 2A. A is the same on both sides for us, right? Because however you compute it for the A variables, it, you better, it's gonna, you're going to get the same answer for A tilde, right? So it's definitely the same A on both sides for us. So you could have this equation, which will translate into p squared over 2, alpha prime p squared over 2, plus n plus n tilde minus 2a. Um, that's it, right? On the state equals 0. And the difference, but the difference is n minus n tilde on the physical state. Zero. By the way, when you include winding, if, if you wanted to include winding, which you might want to do, um, then it's not, not true, actually. This gets a little shifted because the left and right momentas are slightly different in that case. But th don't worry about that now. So this is called level matching. because it says that however many oscillators you have piling up on the left-hand side of the string, you've got to have that same number of oscillators on the right-hand side. Just the same number, not the same mirror image, but the same number. And it has its origins in the fact that really p squared is like a zero mode and you, you can't really ascribe it to either left or right. Okay. Then you're left with this equation, which you have a space-time, you can you know, re rewrite it as the mass shell condition p squared plus 2 over alpha prime, well, n plus n tilde. Well, let me write this. <laughs> it's going to have a complex. So you get this mass squared. So there's a funny 4 that there wasn't before. Oh, not 1. It's not 1, is it? So this is the space-time spectrum of states. So again, the ground state, assuming A is positive, such as 1 is, then the ground state is a tachyon, and it's a very, very bad tachyon, as I said. Nobody knows what to do with it. Uh, so when my, my wife was in her first course of her PhD, some guy said it was economics, and he wrote down a course and said, guy wrote down a question and said, this is a very, very important question. If you solve it, you'll get a Nobel Prize. And the guy sitting next to my wife wrote down, uh, important problem, work on this tonight. <laughs> so, if it, of course, he never finished. Um, <laughs> so, it's a very important problem to understand the closed the close, close string bosonic tachyon. It's a very hard problem, and it's quite realistic that it doesn't go anywhere, in fact. That it, there's just this instability, and it runs away. But I'd love to be proven wrong. Okay. Now, um, of course, what happens next is the same thing. For the magic value of A equals 1, we get massless states at the first excited level. So let's just say A equals 1, okay? Don't give me a hard time. Um, what do you get at level 1? Well, again, let me try to do it this way. I take a smearing of states. And at level one, well, there's only, it's got to be level one on both sides, right? Some, sometimes people call it level one, one. And you stick some indices, and there you go. That's a generic state. So I've summed over the momenta with some smearing function, and I've got level one on both sides. So there you go. There's g mu nu. Um, of course, it's capital G mu nu. It's not the metric, not yet. So, of course, the, the L0 constraint tells us that P squared is 0. So, actually, I have a constraint, if you like, that P squared acting on G is 0. Um, I've got a homework problem for you.
So the problem is to examine all the other constraints. Problem. Show that LP on this thing, which I'll just call G, equals LP tilde on G equals zero for P greater than or equal to one implies P nu G mu nu is P nu G mu nu is zero. Okay? So G by the state G, I mean this, this state I've just written down on the right line. Okay. And it's just uh, completely analogous to the, the, the thing we did with the open string. Okay. So what is G? Well, you should split G up. So G is a D by D tensor. I never said it was symmetric. I never said anything. It's just a G by D tensor, a D by D tensor. So you can split it up. You can let little G mu nu be the symmetric part of big G mu nu, but it's sensible to take off the trace, uh, which is this. And then I can define B mu nu to be the anti-symmetric part, and I can define phi to be the trace. Okay. Ah, yes, well, yeah, thank you, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so why have I done that? It's for the following reason. Uh, in, in D dimensions, these are all acted on by the Lorentz group, right? We've got a Lorentz covariant theory. And G forms a representation of the Lorentz group, but it's a reducible representation of the Lorentz group. And these three objects constructed from capital G form irreducible representations of the Lorentz group. This is a scalar invariant on the Lorentz transformation. This is the antisymmetric tensor, which is a reducible, irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. And that's a symmetric traceless tensor, which again is an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. So there's this mantra in quantum field theory that particles equal irreducible representations of the Lorentz group. Well, these are the particle states then. A symmetric traceless one, a B mu nu and a phi. And of course, they all have common names. This one is going to be the graviton. This one is called the Calbramon. And this is the dilaton. They're important because every single string theory has these as its mass diffeomorphs. And a problem for you, it's, it's good to keep you busy, is yeah, to show that these each form, uh, well, not irreducible, at least, but, but that, they're, that, that each of these fields transforms under it back to itself under a Lorentz transformation. In other words, Lorentz transformation keeps this symmetric and traceless, keeps this constant, and keeps this anti-symmetric. So a problem. show that g mu nu, b mu nu, and phi are mapped to themselves. Under, well, Lorentz transformation. S of one d minus one. So of course, I don't mean to say they're constant, but that they remain in this class. The symmetric traceless ones remain symmetric traceless. The anti-symmetrics remain anti-symmetric. And the trace remains the trace. OK. Yeah. Yes. So that's not really fully understood. Uh, so people do a lot of work on higher spin gauge theories in the hope that this represents some kind of field theory truncation of string theory. No, nope, string theory is perfectly well behaved. It has this magnificent gauge symmetry that we've witnessed, 
which applies to all levels. So it was nice, simple Maxwell gauge symmetry at the zeroth order. If you go to order of five million, it would be some unbelievably complicated gauge symmetry, which apparently makes everything fly. But I think it's basically not really understood. Why the field period limit? They're all massive modes, so it's not clear that field period limit makes sense, actually, I should say. But maybe there's someone who can disagree with me on that. I mean, I'm not an expert. Okay. All right, so let's do this little dance. Okay, so again, there's gauge transformations here. And from a computational point of view, they're going to work very similarly. Oops. to how it worked in the open string. I just have to find the right null states. So the null states would be the following types of things. P, D, P. Now you've got a lambda, um, no, of course it's xi. Xi mu, P, L minus one, A tilde mu, minus one. So that looks like it's gonna be a null state because this is the same old null state we had in the open string, tends to something innocent on the right-hand side. And it is null state. So you can just check it yourself. Well, yeah. And then we can add another one, zeta mu, where it's just opposite arrangement. OK. So actually, this is a two-parameter family of null states. Well, OK. For nullness, you have a few things. P squared is 0. And indeed, P mu xi mu equals P mu zeta mu all the way around equals 0. So it's just like it was for the open string. You, you, you put through the constraints, and you'll see that this is what you get from imposing that. Uh, well, it's clearly a it's clearly a null state, and it's, it's clearly orthogonal to any uh, physical state, right? Because it's got the L minus 1, which acts as L plus 1 onto the left. So it will kill. The only question is, is itself a physical state? And this is what you get from the physical state conditions. This is what L0 gives you, and this is what L1 gives you, and L2 flies through for free. OK. Um, so what does that mean for us? It means that, unfortunately, I rubbed it off, but this G mu nu, capital G mu nu, is equivalent to, um, oh, I should have said, of course, when this acts on the vacuum, just like before, this is proportional to P mu, um, sorry, this is proportional to P mu A tilde minus one, ah, uh, sorry. If you work out what this expression is, it's going to give you something like xi mu. Uh, let me just a minus one. So this goes oh, nu a tilde nu a nu minus one gives you something like that. Because right? l minus one, it's just as before, acting on the vacuum, gives you something like p mu a nu. And here you're going to get something like xi mu, p mu, so it's the opposite ordering, so a minus 1 mu, a tilde minus 1 nu, if you work out what it is. So I recommend you do that. It's really just the same calculation as it was for the open string. So this means that our g will shift to g plus um, p mu, uh, Maybe or P nu xi mu plus zeta mu P nu. 
but you want to split this off in terms of how it acts on the small g, the small b, and the phi, well, on phi, it's easy to work out because you just take the trace of this, the trace of this, but actually because of these conditions, this gives you zero. Right? If I take the trace of this, I get trace back, and then these two are zero. So phi goes to phi. Um, symmetrically, look at the symmetric part. Um, and th that's the trace part. That only tells you that the trace is invariant. So you get that this just becomes, let me write that like this, something symmetric, and v mu would be the sum, I think. And if you work it out for b mu nu, it's b mu nu plus, plus p mu u nu minus p mu u. That's the antisymmetric bit, and u is psi minus theta. Right. So these are the gauge symmetries we encounter at level one, the massless modes of the closed string. Phi is not. Is, is, is gauge invariant? That makes sense because it's a scalar field. It's hard to imagine having a gauge symmetry. This looks terribly familiar because you should think of this it's really in field space as v mu nu plus d mu v nu plus d mu v nu. And hopefully you recognize that as a diffeomorphism of Minkowski space, right? People believe me? Yeah. So that's a diffeomorphism. And this is um, of course B mu nu plus like D mu u nu minus D mu u nu. Now I don't know how many of you know the art of differential forms. Um, if it, v mu nu is antisymmetric with two indices down, so you should think of it as a two form. Yeah? And this transformation you should think of as delta b is d of a one form. It's just a generalization of Maxwell theory to uh, higher objects. So a Maxwell theory is A mu goes to A mu plus D mu of a lambda scalar. Here you've got uh, B mu nu goes to the curl, if you like, of a one form. Okay. Um, so we're happy with the diffeomorphism, and it's also kind of remarkable, right? I mean, we didn't put that in. We have found, by looking at strings fluctuating in Minkowski space, that, uh, w well, maybe we did put it in. <laughs> we have uh, recovered that the target space theory has got general coordinates invariants. That, and also, we should think of it as containing little graviton dynamics. Because it's telling us, OK, the fact that general coordinate variance is not perhaps that novel because we did put that in. It was built in. The original Lagrangian uh, has uh, general coordinate variance. Target string. But what's remarkable is we, we recognize that we've got dynamical fluctuations of the string, which, because fluctuations of space-time metric, apparently, I mean, maybe you think I'm pulling the wool over your eyes, because just because I've called it d mu nu doesn't make it a metric tensor. But trust me, there are other arguments which we'll give later. So you get fluctuations of a metric tensor, and of course, the gauge invariances are just the diffeomorphisms. In other words, it really is a dynamical theory of gravity, as you'd expect. And b is invariant. And often what you do for b is you let uh, h mu nu lambda 
be this object. Because this is, is the thing that will be gauge invariant. So roughly speaking, if I let B, for those who know, be a one, a two form, H, I think if in my notation it's 3 dB. But never mind, it's just the theory of derivative. And of course, what are you left with the equations of motion? The equations of motion are what was that P squared G mu nu was zero. So these are all massless modes. And the gauge fixing condition was this. So we have, of course, that uh, P squared G mu nu is zero, a massless field. P squared B mu nu equals zero, a massless field. And the gauge fixing conditions are, um, so this, of course, is the Laplacian on G mu nu equals zero. And this is the Laplacian on B is zero. Um, we also have Laplacian on phi is zero. If you've written that. And then we have these, these constraints. And these constraints tell you that uh, d mu g mu nu, let me get it right, plus d mu phi equals zero, and d mu b mu nu equals zero. So these are very reasonable gauge fixing constraints in b dimensions. They're just, if you've done linearized gravity, you know that you have constraints like this that you can impose. Uh, and, uh, well, that's just an analog of the Lorentz gauge. Okay. gauge group. Well, so here, of course, it's infinite dimensional. I mean, you, you could, at this stage, you could definitely recognize it as the gauge group of different morphisms of Minkowski space, on Minkowski space. Oh, uh, no, B, it's, uh, well, the language for B is that you have a, a form H, which is a closed form, and you want to mod out by exact forms. So it's just cohomology. In this case, it's a Gram cohomology. Yeah. The B one gauge field. Uh, well, here it's not so. It's not like it's certainly the B field transformations aren't realized in any simple way by like a group action, as far as I'm aware. This is the study of these so-called Jerb theories. Any Jerb experts? That usually shuts people up. If you can never tell. Um, so it's, it's the, I think the bottom line is it's not as simple to say there's a single gauge group underlying the, the gauge symmetry is associated to H. Yeah. So A is associated to line bundles over your manifold and your patching conditions. And B, as far as I understand, is associated to also to line bundles, but where you have triple intersections of the open set. But that's the extent of my knowledge in some Jerk. All right, so I'm going to leave it here for the closed string. Of course, one can do much more. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? Because the next topic will be this light cone gauge, which I've postponed about for so long. So there you start. I mean, at this stage, how many of you are convinced you've seen dynamical gravity, and how many think you've, I've just written down the symbol g mu nu? Okay, so I like to do this covariant quantization because we see the graviton and we see these diffeomorphisms morphisms and we saw the vector field and we saw the Maxwell gauge symmetry and I think that's very important. But we couldn't calculate A or the dimensional space time. So there's another method to quantize the theory. It's called light cone gauge and it makes use of the fact that we got gauge symmetries because we hadn't gauged fixed enough to start off with. So this is light cone gauge. And it's, it's very useful even, yeah. So this is a 
Yes. Of the space time, yeah. So we built in diffeomorphisms of the world sheet, and then we use them to gauge fix to the simple string action. But it's still there in the theory. But we went to a gauge where we choose a fat metric. Yeah? Okay. okay. Well, all right. So Litecoin gauge is very useful. And it results in the following thing. Uh, we used sigma plus and sigma minus. But, and we... Um, we went to like we went to uh, conformal gauge. So we went. We said, "Oh, let's the metric be of the form gamma alpha beta is e to the two rho times eta." Actually, phi. I think we called it. Well, it turns out that we have these two coordinates. If I do a coordinate transformation, which takes sigma plus into sigma plus of sigma plus prime, so just sigma plus prime, and sigma minus to sigma minus, sigma minus prime. So I do, if you like, separate diffeomorphisms on the left and right moving coordinates, but not mixed. Then it turns out that the diffeomorphisms still keep you conformally flat. Yeah? It's fairly easy to work out. Um, in fact, very easy to work out that under this transformation, phi just goes to phi uh, plus a half times the log of d sigma plus by d sigma plus prime, d sigma minus by d sigma minus prime. Right? So under such world sheet reparameterizations, you still remain in the conformal class, conformally flat class. So I can then use conformal symmetry to strip off this new Phi. Yeah, yeah, somewhere they must, you're right. Let's just say they're there. Okay. Um, wh why is this important? Because this is a leftover gauge symmetry in our, in our approach. So I can still rescale these sigma plus and sigma minus this way and keep myself conformally flat, use conformal symmetry to get rid of the conformal factor, and still talk about the Fourier flat world sheet. Um, so I'm allowed to do a bit more gauge fixing, basically. And that's called light cone gauge, and there's a standard way to do it. And frankly, it always looks a bit weird to me, but uh, this is the de facto of choice. Um, So this sigma is a function of sigma prime. It's arbitrary. That means it's a solution to uh, the wave equation because it's just a function of purely left-moving variable. And the same here. So I can choose my sigma and sigma, pri sigma plus and sigma minus to be any functions that satisfy, or left-moving functions that satisfy the wave equation and the choice that everyone does is the following. Um, oh, wait, sorry. You need to do one more step, which is you want to do a similar light cone, uh, what's the word, split in the transverse space. In the so what I do is I take my x, what I'm going to call x plus, and I'm going to call that 1 half x naught plus x d minus 1. And I'm going to take my x minus, and I'm going to call that 1 half x naught minus uh, yeah, x d minus 1. And, and then I'm left with x i, and i runs from 1 to d minus 2. OK? So now I've done, so this is just a coordinate transformation in space time. The reason it's not so popular is because you pick two directions. I've done naught and 25, and the rest are left alone. So these are two solutions to your wave equation. Uh, and so you can use this reparameterization to do the following, and the usual choice is made. x plus is some constant plus alpha prime p plus tau. So you use this residual 
diffeomorphism invariance of, of the string to fix the, uh, this guy, the X, big X field, in terms of tau. So basically, you're using reparameterization invariance to, to cut some of the fluctuations of the string off. Okay. Um, let me, while I've got it here, write that the, the, the space-time metric, e to mu nu, now has the following form. Oh, actually, if I did it, because I did 25, it's delta ij in the middle, minus 2, minus 2, 0. Okay? Useful to keep that in mind. Okay. So the idea now is rather than impose the constraints in, as constraints in the quantum theory, is I'm just going to solve the constraints right off. That's what this cho choice allows me to do. So we'll we will solve the constraints and then quantize. And we'll never have to worry about the constraints. Yippee. And the, the price, the, the upshot will be we'll always have a positive definite Hilbert space. And we'll know, always know exactly what we're doing. OK. So if you work out things here, you get the following equations. So I've just take that substitution in p plus x dot minus, so that's d by d tau, uh, plus OK, so that's got to equal 0. And then the other pieces, t not 1, so this is true because of tracelessness. Yeah? It's not, in fact, apparently true, but T is traceless, and that translates into this condition. Um, and then the off-diagonal piece is minus 2 alpha pi and P plus X at minus plus X dot I X prime J. Okay. Okay. Well, wh what the hell? Um, the point of this is you can solve this, and you will solve it. Problem. Show that the solution to this is, well, so you solve it for x minus. You leave x i as x i's are going to be our fluctuating field, and we're going to solve for x minus, and it's, well, some expansion x little x minus plus alpha prime p minus tau plus i is the oscillators, a n minus, or n, Okay, well, yes, but what? So what are the A's and P's and all that? Um, A, N minus, is 1 over 2 P plus sum over M, A N minus M, I, A J, M, delta I J, where I've expanded xi's just as I did before, okay, in terms of ai and ai tilde oscillators. Right. So that's what these are. And there's a similar formula for a tilde, okay? So a tilde 1 over 2p plus sum over m, ai tilde n minus m, a n j tilde delta ij. Okay, so that's 
this and this, and you get p minus, well, you just get it from the space-time version of the L0 constraint, which looks a little funny in these coordinates, but it's just the following, minus 4 alpha prime p plus p minus. That's just g mu nu p mu p nu in the not 25 direction. Um, plus pi pj delta ij alpha prime, sorry. That's just p squared in the remaining spatial directions. And then plus 2n plus n tilde. And these are the n's that you construct from the i oscillators. Okay? But I won't bother to write that down. But they're the same n's as before, but you're only summing over the i oscillators. So i equals 1 to d minus 1. D minus 2, sorry. So this is just telling us, this is just p squared. So we get the formula m squared is what? Uh, 2 over alpha prime n plus n tilde minus 2ax. Um, and also you find you still have the constraint of level matching n equals n tilde. Uh, again, for the same reason, because there's only one space-time momentum p mu. There's not p mu left, there's not p mu right. Uh, basically, that means that a zero left the oscillator, quote unquote, the A0 oscillator left has to be called A0 oscillator right. Okay. Now, we haven't quantized it. This is the classical theory. But now we can quantize it. Yeah. So I've tried to write all the formulas in one board. Um, right, so now we want to turn on uh, the quantization of this theory. Oh, yeah, well, I'm uh, sorry, I was jumping ahead. Uh, that, yeah, <laughs> that, you're right. Uh, that shouldn't be there until I do the quantization. So let's go through how the quantization would work. What's wrong? Everything goes through just as before. The A's have the same, co the AIs have the same commutation relations. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. That's just I looked at. Maybe it was habit that made me write that down. So right now that doesn't exist. So that shouldn't be there in the classical theory. So how does it go? It, but it is there in the quantum theory. Why? Well, we're going to quantize. You go through the same steps. You have, of course, the same a i n a j m since n delta i j delta m plus n delta m minus n. Same thing, same relations as before. Now you have to worry about normal ordering. What do you have to worry about normal ordering? A minus and a minus tilde. They suffer normal ordering ambiguities. Right, because they're quadratic. But again, only A0 and A0 tilde minus suffer the normal ordering ambiguity because the others always have commuting, right? So A, excuse me, AN minus must be normal ordered.
that only affects a minus zero, a tilde minus zero. And it's the same problem, what is it? The normal ordered form of a minus zero is what? Well, one over two p plus, um, well, first I do the sum on m positive, a n minus m a m, that's already normal order. Then I have the zero mode piece, uh, sorry, well, the zero mode piece, a zero i, a zero j. And then I have the negative norms, the negative modes. Oh, n is, n is zero, that would be a little more helpful. Uh, so again, that's like this, but the other way around. Okay, so to normal order this, I have to commute these guys through just as before. That gives me the same term here, plus the infinite constant. So I get one over p plus plus a half a naught i, a naught j. And then what's this normal ordering constant now? Plus a half times all the commutators, and the commutators are n equals one to infinity of m delta ij delta ij. Right? This is the infinite constant that I take away and replace with something that I just regularize and call a. It, and I'm calling it the same a. Because it's well, the justification is it's going to feed now into that equation for m squared. If I shift a by uh, a constant. All right. So. Of course, similarly for the right moon. So the, what we declare is that the normal ordered form of A0 minus is 1 over P plus A minus M AM. Um, uh, plus this. Uh, And then we subtract off uh, A as before. We just declare it to be A. Now, my notes, I don't have the zero mode piece. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. There shouldn't be a zero mode piece in this expansion, which is some for A minus. OK. Um, so this all feeds through, and that's what produces the m squared minus 2A that I wrote down prematurely. So end result is normal ordered, and now the mass squared changes. OK. Well, we're back to where we were, with, and A is the same A, apparently. But formally for us, A, well, it's going to be uh, 1 over 2 d minus 2, the d minus 2 comes from well, delta ij, delta ij. And then it's this infinite sum. OK, so still infinite. But 
Lycon gauge has a great advantage that there's no negative norm states anymore because I create everything using the AIs, right? So all my states are what? Well, there's a ground state with momentum P, I, and P minus and P plus, and then I would have A minus one I on it in the open string case. Of course, the closed string case, I'd have left and right. And you could keep going, but there's no negative norm states and there's no gauge invariance. There's no, there are no uh, null states to consider. Uh, and the, the Hilbert space is positive definite, so that's it. I mean, what you immediately land on here are the D minus two physical states of a photon in D dimensions, right? Whereas before, we landed on a covariant description of a photon, which has two extra states which aren't physical. Uh, here you just land on the physical states. And if I do the open, the closed string, I get the tachyonic ground state, A minus one I, A minus uh, one I J, sorry, zero P for the tachyon. And then here I get, Side missing, possibly. A? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. There is a minus sign missing. And, and the reason is because of the way I defined it as being minus A here. Yeah, thank you. So this minus sign cancels this minus sign. It gives me the right thing. Yeah. So you know the cheat that's coming up. Uh, so you construct all these states, they're manifestly positive definite, there's no remnant of gauge symmetry, you're, you know, it's great, um, but, it's, but also you don't exactly, it's not so clear what, you, what theory you've landed on. But you can somewhat trust this calculation now because it, you can com you're just computing it in a field theory of positive definite norms. So you can take it a little bit more seriously. How seriously you want to take it is up to you because <laughs> I never take it that seriously. Because what's going to follow now is one of the famous slides of hands, uh, which is we're going to regulate this using zeta function regularization. And we're going to say, well, this is minus d minus 2 over 2 times zeta of minus 1. And zeta of s is this famous Riemann zeta function. So that's the Riemann zeta function. It has a very nice property. The property is that if you view S as a complex variable, then zeta of S is analytic, provided the real part of S is greater than one. Um, and hence, it can be uniquely analytically continued to the whole complex plane. In such a way, it turns out that it has only one pole, and that pole is S equals one, and hence the mathematician, I don't know how to do this myself, but the mathematicians can compute for you what zeta of minus one is. And it's a famous result oh, that it is minus a 12. So ask a mathematician or ask Maple. <laughs> and zeta of minus one is perfectly well-defined object it's minus 12. I always think it's amusing because it's, it's the minus sign is the only thing that makes this credible, right? <laughs> if I told you 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to 12, you'd never believe me. But if I say it's minus a 12, you think I'm profound. Anyway, uh, it's a regularization prescription, and it's in that sense, it's as unambiguous as any regularization prescription. Okay, so now we have a value for A. Um, there we 
that is. The interpretation of this, of course, is that each physical scalar field, so you've gone to light cone gauge, one way to think about light cone gauge is you have a two-dimensional world sheet and it's fluttering in the breeze, right? And you've got diffeomorphisms in two dimensions and you've got diffeomorphisms in space-time. So you can nail the, your fluctuating sheet to space-time by a diffeomorphism. So you've killed two of the possible vibrational modes of the string by simply uh, identifying the coordinates in a smart way. So physically, you can actually only vibrate in d minus two spatial ways. So physically, you really only have d minus two scalar fields fluctuating, and each one of them is contributing one over 24 to the ground state energy, to this A. So that's an important mnemonic, because for example, d brains, and when we do um, super strings, you will get different values of A, but if you remember that uh, each boson gives you 1 over 24, you'll know how to compute A in other circumstances. <coughs> now, one argument you could give why you want D equals 26 for the bosonic string is that we've already seen A equals 1 is the good choice. A equals 1 gave us all that lovely gauge structure. So we want A equals 1 to get nice massless modes and gauge theories and things. So that, of course, implies d equals 26. So please put your hands up if you are convinced by this argument. Good. I can go home. No, I, you know, you're not reasonably. String theory is supposed to be built on a better foundation than that, right? Well, there is a better foundation. First of all, you can quantize it in several ways. And in the most modern fate of proper path integral techniques, it pops out uh, unambiguously. Here, what have we been doing? Well, we went to light cone gauge, and light cone gauge is just a gauge, right? Um, we haven't broken uh, d dimensional Lorentz transformations. Right? We've just written everything in a, in, a form in a form where they're not manifestly covariant. And if you remember, I wrote down this guy, which was way back. These are the conserved charges associated to Lorentz generators in space time. So th this is a 26 by 26 ma uh, matrix of charges. And they satisfy, at classical level, they satisfy the Lorentz algebra, okay? In D dimensions. Mm-hmm. Uh, just some constant. Well, we did. We did say it was just for some constant, but of course it was slightly. Hmm? Yeah, we could have done the same thing there, and actually we've got the wrong answer naively because it's not d that appears, not d minus two that appears there. It's d d. If you looked at it, but that theory is full of negative norm states and negative norm things. So I don't think that computation flies so easily if you have, you know, time-like oscillators with negative energy. So. To be honest, in my opinion, these calculations aren't exactly on the solid, solid ground as we'd like. But there are other methods which are. Um, but let me go back to this point. So if you look at uh, these Ms, they satisfy the Lorentz algebra in D dimensions, classically. Now what we've done is we've split them. So we have Mij, and then you'll have things like m plus m minus, m plus i, m plus 
m minus i, things like that, right? Now, the, the way that we proceeded, the quantization scheme we've chosen, only preserves SOD. So, SO1 d minus 1, we've broken it. It still exists, but we've, our notation has broken it to SOD minus 2 times, well, we still have world sheet, conformal symmetry, uh, symmetry. So that's what we've done. So everything like m mu nu splits up into all these possible objects. So the um, algebra of these guys is preserved. But if you look, when you do normal ordering, this algebra, the Lorentz algebra, is broken by the quantum effects, normal ordering. And you only recover the Lorentz algebra in d dimensions if d is 26 and a equals 1. It's a hard calculation to do. It takes a lot of pages. It's written in the textbook. But it's a very, that's quite a convincing argument. It says that if I go to light cone gauge, which is just a gauge choice, and I quantize the theory, there is an anomaly in space-time Lorentz invariance unless d equals 26 and a equals 1. Now, you could say to me, oh, Neil, well, maybe I'm happy to live with the anomaly. And actually, you can. It's a bit of a lie that string theory predicts d equals 26. It doesn't. It only predicts d equals 26 if you want flat Minkowski space. If you're willing to have other things, like linear dilettons or what have you, then you can have very uh, dimensions. It's not actually strictly speaking true that string theory can only be defined in 26 flat space time dimensions. But if you want Lorentz symmetry, then it's d equals 26, a equals 1. So that's a pretty convincing argument, in my opinion, plus the existence of other methods. OK. Uh, so are there any questions on light cone gauge? Yeah, it was a quite a quick review of it. No? Good. So one other topic that we can get to today then. Ah, yeah. That's correct. But so they have a dual Some description. Mm -hmm. Can we postpone this question for a day or two? Because it's uh, so the question is whether or not D brains should be viewed as coming from open strings or from closed strings, right? Roughly. And the, well, the answer is in some sense both. There's a duality. That's what the ADS CFT correspondence is based on. But formally, the definition of a D brain is in terms of open strings that end. But there, I have another interpretation, which is they exist as solitonic solutions of a closed string theorem. So they look like big gravitational objects, like black holes. They look like extreme right to the black holes uh, of the bulk gravity. But they're microscopic descriptions in terms of open strings. So they also have a sort of a large end description, a large distance heavy object description as, as well, they're gravitating objects. So they have solutions in terms of gravity. And it's the fact that they have the dual description one in terms of Young Mills theory, the op open strings, and one in terms of the closed string gravitation, gravitation, which is basically the origin of the ADS CFT correspondence gravity equals gauge theory. Okay. Okay. So I want to mention one other thing that pops up occasionally, or all the time, perhaps is a better. And that's this a notion of a partition function for a string. So So first I'll just say what it is, and then we'll worry about what it might mean. So you want to just sort of have a device that's counting for you all the physical states because there's a, there's a huge number, right? You, you start off with one in the vacuum, and then there's 24, basically, at uh, massless level. And then 
there's one at the next massive level, I don't remember how many, but the number actually grows exponentially. As you go up and up and up in, on the level, n, of the uh, string physical states, you get exponentially more and more functions. So you simply define z to be the sum of the states, and you have something q, and then you do l naught minus 1. So q is your placeholder. And often you write it as e to the minus 2 pi t, with t as another placeholder. OK? Um, so we want to compute this thing. So we're summing over all the states. Well, of course, the best physical state. And we're going to do it at zero momentum. So we're just going to ignore the momentum. We're just counting, if you like, the number of states that exist, the number of ways I can arrange my oscillators. And we're, we're going to do it in light going gauge because I don't want to worry about gauge artifacts. Okay? Well, the first thing you realize is that L is a sum, and, and we'll, D, is, D is 26, right? And A is 1, that's really A. It's the sum of various L zeros from. Uh, Free theory for, for, of one boson. I don't know how to notate that. Uh, one boson. So since L is the sum of smaller Ls, actually Z, if you like, is uh, a product or a power of 24th power of one Z, where Z is just uh, the partition function when I have only one oscillator. Not, so I've, I'm now going to drop the mu index. Uh, the first part, uh, is a formal question mark? So it's all over all states. Like a trace. Yeah, you can think of it as a trace, yeah. Okay. And the second part uh, goes from 1 to 24. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's even a product because it's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same, it's copies of, it's, for, for counting perspective, it's just 24 copies of one oscillating mode. Well, one x, right? Where, so let me continue. Z one here would be the sum of the physical states of Q, and what's L naught at zero momentum for a single oscillator, a single oscillator with a single x? It would be the sum on L of L a minus L a l. Actually, I've changed my notation up here. Um, yeah shouldn't have that. Um, and L is positive. And I get minus 1 over 24. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of people go through. I don't know why I'm okay. Now, It's, it's just a placeholder. It's a counting device at this stage, right? We can come back to it later. So uh, can you, you can ask that question in 10 minutes it, it, after the talk, lecture if it's still bothering you. It does have a physical interpretation. I mean, basically, if you expand in powers of Q, you read off the, the power of Q to the zero, that's the number of massless modes. You expand to linear order in Q, that's the number of mass level one modes. Q squared is level two modes. So it's just a counting device. OK. So how to proceed? Well, OK. Uh, let me factor out the Q. And then the sum again of all the L's, so there's, there's all these different oscillators, A L, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. So it's a product on the L's, uh, one to infinity of Q to the A minus L, A L. Now, if you have A L, you have what? You have this state, uh, this state, 
the state ad infinitum. So you have a sum, so summing over all the, if there's some in here, tracing, if you like, over all these guys is summing over the power, and each one of these contributes, uh, this would contribute L to the number operator, this would contribute 2L to the number operator, and 3L and 4L. So I'm just left with 1 over Q to the 24, product over L, the sum of Q to the L from, oh no, I shouldn't call it L, K, K equals zero to infinity, where this is K equals zero, K equals one, K equals two, blah, blah, blah. You can do this sum. Uh, it is one over one minus Q. Uh, there's a missing L, this should be KL. Right. This guy contributes nothing to the number operator. This contributes L. This contributes 2L, uh, 3L, 4L, 5L, 6L, all the way up. So this is just the geometric sum. You can sum it up, and you get this. Right. Well, now you can take the 24th power and our partition function that we were after is Q inverse product 1 to the 24, 1 minus Q to the L to the minus 24. So what? You might say, but this is actually a famous function. Yeah? This is called the dedekind eta function. Now you usually view it as a function of T rather than Q. Well, that's a matter of taste. Uh, It is also an analytic function when you take, you allow t, well, yeah. Now what? You can sort of generalize t to be, um, so here I've got q is e to the minus 2 pi t, t But this eta function is often expanded to be a function of the whole upper half complex plane by actually thinking of it as q is e to the 2 pi i tau. And tau you think of as some angular variable theta plus i t. So right, taking theta equals 0, I've got what I always had. But it, it, you can expand it to be upper half complex plane because we want, we need t to be positive. Otherwise the thing won't converge at all, right? What's the miracle about this dedicated eta function, so go, go ask your mathematician friend, is that eta of minus one over tau is eta of tau. For us, because we don't have theta, this means that eta of 1 over t is eta of t. Yeah, it's, that's obvious, right? Because it's a function of q. Okay. So how can you interpret this? So this is leads to a notion of what's called modular invariance <laughs> because this is a modular, well, so there's two transformations, tau goes to tau plus one built in, and this one not built in, but true. And that generates the modular group. And this is a very deep requirement of string theory. Uh, and in fact, you can see that we got modular invariance because of 24 oscillators. It's another proof that V equals 26 is what you want. Yeah, I'm just counting the states. I'm, I'm not worrying about the momentum at this stage. And uh, the states of uh, open string. Open, I'm doing open string. So you can do a similar thing for the closed string. I'm not going to bother. We have a Q, and maybe it's complex conjugate. And you have L0 and L0 bar. And actually, it, I'm going off topic, but 
my, my lecture. Um, the closed string you might consider a thing like this. But you have to do level matching. And you can realize this as an integral d theta e to the 2 pi i theta l naught minus l naught bar. And actually, so when you write this out, you get d theta. Um, and it starts to look like q of tau. Sorry. That's where the theta arises when you expand to modular ring. That's off for the closed string. So for the closed string, you really do see theta. And it comes as a constraint to impose level matching. But I, I don't want to talk about that now. All right. So let, let me quickly uh, say, well, OK, that's nice. That's something that adds up. Uh, what's it do? What's it doing for us? Well, there is a physical interpretation. Actually, I'm wondering if I should take a long time. Hmm? Some other gauges, yes. So in that case, uh, I'm not sure the real ending is like. Uh, no, nope. so you can compute it the path integral for sure. What happens in the path integral though is you you get 26 modes. Whoops, but the path integral comes with failure pop off ghosts, and they contribute with the opposite sign, and uh, so you get uh, minus two back, roughly speaking. But you have to include the ghost okay. from 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 gauge fixing world sheet uh, diffeomorphisms. So it's one of the deepest, most important things about uh, string theory is that. So when we come to generalize it, it's really the the world sheet theory is a conformal field theory, that's ne necessary for its coupling to gravity to be consistent. But furthermore, it has to be a conformal field theory which is modular invariant. Now, this is that's what's special about d equals 26. Uh, the best way to uh, now I'm not a CFT expert, so and there's very many deep things one can say about modular invariants. But one of them is uh, that I'm really jumping ahead of myself here. But you need to define string theory not just on the plane like we've been doing. You're going to need to define it on arbitrary Riemann surfaces to compute string scattering. And given the conformal field theory on a, a set one surface, so now you have to define it for all these different Riemann surfaces. And I believe it's a modular invariance that allows you to extend the definition of your CFT to its higher genus Riemann surfaces, and hence extend the string theory beyond leading order and presentation. Of it. Does that mean anything to anyone? It might mean something more when I've discussed what string perturbation theory is. Um, but I, I see I've only got a minute left, so maybe I will postpone the discussion about what a physical interpretation for this until tomorrow. Yeah, because it's otherwise it'll take ten minutes or something. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so you said that the integral of twenty six is not uh, just if I want space time to be Minkowski, then only the integral of twenty six. Yes. So suppose I I don't uh, regard that. So yeah. In all the other cases, the modular invariance is not there. No, it's there too. Yeah. Um, but but you don't get three bosons. <laughs> oh, so I get other stuff. You get other stuff. Yeah. See, one of the problems is if you don't want d equals twenty six, then you're going to get curved spaces. You could you can dial d to what you like. But your space, if it's not d equals twenty six, you're not going to get flat space time out, and your space time is going to be curved. Heavily, it's going to be so curved. It's going to be curved. Well, there's only one scale. It's going to be curved according to its alpha prime scale. So, if d is not equal to 26, your strings are propagating in a space-time whose curvature is roughly the size of the string. So, these don't really have any classical big space-time interpretation. <laughs> yeah. You can do it, definitely. 
Um, but, you know, you can't fit yourself in it. You couldn't create a universe that way which was big enough to put you in as a classical object. So from an, it's really, it's a phenomenological constraint. You know, I want to produce a string vacuum that's big enough to fit the observable universe. And that would be difficult with D1 to equal 26. But there has been some work. I mean, uh, you know, anything might be possible. It's just very difficult. This is very, you know, a lot of string theory proceeds because the free boson is easy and you can work with it. And whereas when it's strongly coupled it, 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 on high curvature, it's, it's difficult. But I think Eva Silverstein did some work, for example, where she was able to get the sitter space out of like what's called supercritical string theory. So if D is greater than 26, it's called supercritical string theory. And of course, if D is less than 26, it's called subcritical string theory. But in principle, it might, that we might live there. I just know I've been able to do it. Well, so here it's breaking, broken really badly, right? It, really <laughs> it would be completely absent at the... Well, it's not so much that... Yeah. It's, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say it's, possi it's possibly possible. <laughs> but these things become very difficult to deal with, right? Um, and all the successes of string theory I mean, I think it's fair to say all the successes of string theory are based on the, well, they're based on the superstring where the critical dimension is d equals 10. And I don't think there's been any significant result in string theory where you take d off 10. You know, it's not to say there aren't good papers, but there's no great results. Well, they should be, because they're all supposed to arise from some kind of consistent quantization. Well, at this point, I, maybe you, we can talk, but maybe people want to go get their coffee. And we will continue tomorrow with uh, the partition function. And, and after the partition function, uh, I'm going to do a space-time effective action, which is a bit of a conceptual jump, and then superstring. Okay.